I am a collector of vintage and lost news media. After acquiring a collection of old small town papers from a tiny library that was shutting down its doors, one piece stuck out to me. It was not dated and faded like the rest of the collection. It looked like it had been bought in that morning. It contained the most unusual subject matter, and I would have passed it off as some work of outsider art if not for the images contained within and the unsettling events unfolding in the wake of my attempts to find the source of this article. Perhaps you too, dear reader, will come to believe in the events at Grouse Springs, or maybe you will dismiss it as so many others have. As I had initially, maybe it's easier to continue living as if nothing like this could change our daily life. And I fear that it already has. Blast Radius, an investigation into the tragedy and cover-up of Grouse Springs, by Douglas Ray Cleavon, published August 2021. In one afternoon, Grouse Springs, Virginia went from being a sleepy farming town to a place soaked in infamy. It is now spoken almost exclusively in the company of names such as Three Mile Island, Fukushima, and Chernobyl. Residents across the East Coast remember June 23, 2016 as a day of unique terror, forced to take shelter in Cold War era bomb shelters, while the rest of the country recalls a fear of threats to our capital city, evacuation, a panic. 1,437 lives lost, some with bodies that still haven't been found even years later. 1,437 friends, children, loved ones. Gone. In the Grouse Springs nuclear plant's official statement claimed that the planet experienced the loss of coolant incident at the hands of some negligent employee who had mistakenly stopped the flow, causing the pipes to burst from heat and the dangerously outdated graphite tips to catch fire and begin a nuclear meltdown. The fire spread rapidly to the town, and due to a delayed warning system, not everyone had time to make it out. All 532 employees of the power plant were killed, as well as 408 first responders and 497 civilians living in Grow Springs itself. Fortunately, as the story goes, military assistance stepped in to assure no more radiation spread and that no more lives were lost. The video footage still exists on the internet, taken by survivors returning to salvage belongings of people who had burned in their cars for leaving just seconds too late. Those who didn't make it out of Grow Springs had perished badly. Even those who had survived the initial danger weren't safe, passing weeks later of radiation poisoning, skin sloughing off. Pets and livestock were killed and acres of beautiful Virginia old-growth forest had been razed. Fortunately, as the story goes, the danger will pass. Life will return eventually and forests will grow back. All those who died could not be replaced. Survivors were given a hefty sum of government money to try to build a new life and move on. Many of these survivors of Grow Springs were reluctant to speak to the media both civilians and first responders alike. Understandably so, even years can't do the trauma associated with such a terrible loss of life. Some alleged witnesses, however, claim that the payout was merely to buy their silence. Lead-lined coffins hide bodies very, very well. Viral videos posted on social media before technology began to fail depict scenes of violence not able to be attributed to radiation poisoning or panic. Animals were seen in the days after damaged in ways that seemed closer to genetic defects than the result of injury. Reports of wildlife that had fused or plants that had thrashed and screamed, of figures looming out of fire. A user on the conspiracy forum Truth Seekers going by 98765 in Grouse Springs made a post on March 4th of last year stating, I was at Grow Springs. No blue light. No Cherenikov radiation. 
followed five minutes later by no Cherenikov, no water, no burst pipes. The account and subsequently the post were deleted 24 hours later. However, a second account showed up by the name of Grouse Springs Massacre, this time in the popular photo sharing site Instagram, claiming to be 98765 Girl Springs, sending screen caps to hundreds of users with the original tweets, captioned, They deleted my account. Anyone who says they saw a regular fire there are lying. The Grow Springs Massacre account was deleted again 24 hours later. Although this user was likely just buying into conspiracy, there was one factor that made this post notable. The image used as the account's profile picture was from Grow Springs, the day of the massacre and it had never been published before. Many groups outright rejected my attempts at contact and others still were cold, hostile, or otherwise disinterested. Still, I persisted. There was something here, so I ran an advertisement, pooling money to run a campaign. This remained unsuccessful for months, alternating between long periods of silence and pranksters. That was until I received a phone call on my personal phone from a man that I had never spoken to before. He contacted me around 4 in the morning and I answered, blurry-eyed, glasses still tucked away on the nightstand. A Cleveland residence. I heard shuffling on the other end of the line before a quiet voice said, Is this Douglas? Yes, to whom am I speaking? I'm a... My name's Pete Kitts. Saw your ad online a while ago and I could use the money if you still got it. He was so quiet that I could barely hear him, but I was instantly awake, quickly grabbing my glasses and a pen and paper to write down a time and place to meet. Peter J. Kitts, or Pete, as he styles himself, is a big guy. Not in stature, but in everything else. Pete has a big laugh, a big personality, big boots, and at the age of 30, a big gambling problem. That's why he contacted me, he said. Well, I was out of rent money for the week since I was down to the tracks all day the Sunday before and, uh, I saved your number just in case I needed something on the side, Petey had explained, as he showed me the paperwork proving that he indeed received his settlement money from the Grouse Springs accident. It's all gone. We ended up meeting at a hotel cafe, neither of us wanting to introduce stories of Grouse Springs to our homes. The idea still felt taboo as if we would be invoking it at our place of living, if we so much as had mentioned it there. I started my tape recorder setting it between us. Pete Kitts arrived at a local bar owned by a couple who had happened to be out of town on July 23rd, around 7pm the day of the accident. By 9.45pm, everyone who remained in the bar was dead. The fire had spread to the town proper through the thick trees and undergrowth surrounding the power plant, and by 8.12 p.m. beginning to engulf the businesses and homes of the residents of Grouse Springs. Emergency services had begun moving people out as quickly as possible. Kitts himself was rescued by a civilian vehicle, a good Samaritan trying to fit as many people in as possible. Exiting the building, he could see the smoke trailing from the direction of the trees accompanied by a smell that he described as metallic. I was in this bar, you know, nailheads right by the corner of 52nd and West, out with my buddies after work. And I'm looking, well, nothing's wrong with looking at the girls, right? As long as I'm not buying drinks for them. And my coworker Dave says to me, why don't you buy that brunette over there a drink? I'm sitting there thinking, man, Angelica would be so pissed if I did that, so I tell him. Uh, my girlfriend, she doesn't want me doing that stuff. So then Dave says, No, oh, so you're letting that little flat chest make decisions for you now. And that upset me, so I was about to say something, but then I noticed. With this, the previous the animate Pete set his jaw and looked out the window, like he was struggling not to cry. He furrowed his brows hard and put his hand on his chin. What did you notice, Pete? 
He swallowed before continuing, voice shaky. I noticed that brunette went real still. Not just like standing still, but real still. She wasn't even breathing. Her hair was frozen too, like somebody had set her on pause right in the middle of dancing. And then there was this bulge in her stomach. It was like she was pregnant. But it hadn't been there before. And I'm staring at her and Dave tries to get my attention before he sees what I'm staring at and then he's staring at her too. And then her friends notice and they're all screaming and the music cuts off and nobody knows what to do because something is obviously wrong with the chick but how are you supposed to call an ambulance when you don't even know what's happening to her? And the bulge it starts moving, moving up, like traveling from her stomach up to her chest and you could see her bones cracking and her friends are shaking her, trying to get her to unfreeze or wake up or whatever. And they're crying and screaming and Dave just whispers, What the heck, man? So I called 911. Nobody answered. I think that was about the time the rest of the town was going to crap too. So ain't nobody there to answer the phone. But I doubted that it made a difference anyway with what had happened to her. You see, that bulge had just kept on growing up, up her neck. God, it was so awful. And these hands just came out of her mouth, one grab in each jaw, and they just peeled her away. All inside out, red everywhere. Their guts spilling all over the floor. It smelled awful too. A few of her friends couldn't keep their stuff down. Uh, I wanted to join them. It felt like it was going on forever, her body just opening and opening and opening. And nobody could see what was inside and I was thinking, Crap, it's a face hugger. Now we're all going to split in half and die. But it was just her, man. Once all the skin and meat was on the floor, it was just that same brunette, covered in red, unfrozen. It was just her, and she was still dancing. As a collector of vintage and lost newspaper media, it is rare that my hobby takes me into the field. Much of my time is spent in small town museums, estate sales, or antique stories. In pursuit of the truth, finding out if Grouse Springs existed, if Douglas Ray Cleavon was just the construct of a creative project, I found myself in the Appalachian backwood, shovel in hand. Although there was no church and no town, I still somehow managed to find three perfect headstones, and along with them, three bodies. Even to an untrained eye through the state of decay, I could tell that something had gone deeply, terribly wrong. Horrified, I returned them to their rest and went back to my home. That night, I purchased a firearm for the first time in my entire life. You would be wise to do the same. Blast Radius, an investigation into the tragedy and cover-up of Grouse Springs, by Douglas Ray Cleavon. Published August 2021. The story of the woman at the bar left me floored. Nobody could have predicted as such a gruesome turn of events and I left the interview quickly. I had given Kitts the money that I had promised but internally, I had brushed him off as a grifter. However, this led me down a rabbit hole. How would I verify what had happened that day, outside of eyewitness accounts? This line of thought led me on a short road trip to Manassas, Virginia. Due to the number of casualties resulting from the incident at Grill Springs, many coroner's offices from across Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. were required to step in and assist in the examination and identification of bodies. Grouse Springs was considered the primary jurisdiction of the Northern Virginia office, so I figured that would be my best starting point. Luckily, it was also my last. The medical examiner herself refused to speak with me, but a young investigator who received my email decided to contact me instead. He asked to only be identified as Cole, as he felt that coming forward may potentially jeopardize his career 
and his safety. On his lunch break, he slipped into my vehicle, where we began our interview. He brought a manila folder with a few papers inside and told me that they were for later. How long have you worked for the office? He kept his gaze forward as he answered the question but smiled slightly. I've been here for five years. Most people leave after one or two, so I guess you could call me a veteran. And what were your experiences in the days following June 23rd, 2016? I was only an autopsy technician at the time, he said. It was my first year. Talk about an introduction. We were all working 15 and 16 hour days, going nuts so that we could process the amount of decedents that we were receiving. Everybody had to wear one of those big white hazmat suits, which made the actual examination and sampling a huge pain in the butt. It was exhausting. I was terrified of radiation poisoning too. I mean, some of these bodies, man, all burned up, black, down to the bone in some places. And their faces were twisted too. Like whatever had happened to them hurt so bad that they carried it right to the second that they had died. We all had these little devices clipped to our suits called a personal dosimeter. I thought I was lucky when mine didn't indicate any significant exposure to radiation. Towards the end of the fourth day, almost everybody was stressed to the point of breaking. I guess that I was still so green that it was all exciting almost. Like I hadn't been in the business long enough for it to really get under my skin. Yet. So that's how I ended up being pulled into an exam room with the coroner himself. By these two guys in suits that I'm sure were from some three letter agency. To this day, I'm still not really sure who they were. Now, when I say that these next bodies had bothered me, that they were strange, I want you to understand that I don't say that lightly. I worked a case one time where the guy just seemed to drop dead in a locked hotel room. Nobody could figure it out until the pathologist noticed a laceration. It turned out some idiot was messing around with a gun in the room underneath him and shot him right in the groin. One night, I had to drive out to the middle of a parking garage to help some guys from the funeral home pick up a body. When I got there, there was a suitcase, just sitting there all stained and dingy. But it stunk at that sickly sweet, meaty decay smell, and the guys told me that the decedent was inside. So all three of us lifted this thing up and I guess the body had been in there for a while and the polyester had just given and gave out along the bottom. The body sloshed out all over us, this nasty and greasy black sludge that had been stewing for who knows how long. I smelled like that suitcase for days. Anyways, my point is, none of that was worse than the three bodies that I had to look at. I thought that it was a joke at first. I mean, two guys in suits come and tell me to take my hazmat suit off and that I'm needed urgently. It sounded like a prank. But the coroner, God bless his soul, was a serious, old school type of doctor. And it just wasn't his style. He looked positively grave when he stepped into the exam room. No pun intended. And the first decedent was a woman, early 20s, older than I was at the time. Here, he handed me the folder. This is a copy of the autopsy report. I technically shouldn't have this, so be careful with it. She had similar injuries to the other bodies. Burns, suspected as shrapnel injuries, that sort of thing. But there were other things. The fingers on her left hand were missing at the second joint, with marks consistent with those of human teeth. On that arm, there were wounds consistent with those of what I thought was a knife. I pointed this out to the coroner who immediately corrected me. Not a knife, he said. Not a knife. These are claw marks. Now, there are a lot of hiking trails out here. Every once in a while, somebody will die out in the woods and of course, animals will be attracted to them. So it's not uncommon to see a body that had been mauled by something like a black bear, for example. But what bear would be mauling people in the middle of a nuclear meltdown? Another thing, 
When a decedent has been sitting for a while, the body undergoes something called liver mortis. Once the heart stops pumping blood around, it all just kind of settles at the bottom from gravity. This usually takes a couple of hours, but this body had none of that. It was just all pale. Even the deep and fatty slash marks on the arm were just sitting open. After we finished the examination, we opened her up, and there wasn't any blood, nothing. Not like an injury where somebody bleeds out. It was like she never had any in the first place. Cole was wide-eyed as he recounted this, as if he could hardly believe it himself. I had no doubt that he was telling the truth. What was the body like internally? It was. She was all solid inside, like her fatted muscle had all turned to soap. We didn't even have time to think about it though, because as soon as we were done with her, we had to move on to the next one. This next decedent was an older guy, who looked mostly untouched by whatever was happening at Gross Springs. The only weird thing was how light he was when we moved him onto the table. He wasn't exactly a slender dude or anything, so I almost dropped him on the floor, just because I lifted him with my more heft than I really needed. Visual examination didn't reveal much, no visible injuries, so we were thinking maybe he had died of smoke inhalation or something. Palpitation when you feel to see if there are broken bones or anything, it didn't reveal much either. It just kind of felt spongy. So we started the internal examination. Some parts were there. He had blood and fat and muscle and bones. But we go to check the lungs and they aren't there. No heart, no intestines. I would say about 90% of his organs weren't there. It was upsetting for some reason that the girl had been. It just wasn't right. But the worst part didn't happen until we went to put him back. And we pulled out the ice box and sitting in the tray where the body just was were all of his missing body parts. Perfectly arranged, just like how they would sit if they were inside of him. And they weren't there before. I don't... I, there isn't any logical way that can happen. There just isn't. So I look towards the guys in the suits and they just order us to open the guy up and put everything back in. And so that's what we did. The last guy, everything started off normal. Or as normal as an autopsy in the wake of a nuclear accident can be, I guess. I was almost relieved, but part of me knew if these guys wanted us to examine him here and now, something was going to be wrong. And there was. The cause of death seemed pretty obvious, due to the extent of injury, but we were told that we needed to remove the brain for sampling. The brain itself seemed normal, but the inside of the skull was hollow and dark. There isn't really a lot of space in there in a regular body, but this guy's skull was shadowed inside like a tunnel. One of the guys in suits handed the coroner a flashlight. The coroner was old guard, the kind of guy who didn't make jokes in the job, the kind of guy who carried a flask filled with a scotch around that he would sip regardless of who he thought would see. But when he took that flashlight and looked in that guy's head, he smiled. Look, he told me, I didn't really see anything, just shadow and a mess of membranes and veins that stretched impossibly on past the beam of light. Don't you see it? I didn't see anything. It's beautiful, he told me. Here, hold this, he said. He handed me the flashlight and before I could say anything, he put one arm inside of the guy's head up to the elbow. Just looking at it made me feel sick. One time, I broke my finger and it ended up at a 90 degree angle, in a way that a limb shouldn't bend. I had to close my eyes, not because it hurt too bad or anything, but because I just hated looking at it. It shouldn't have been possible. Watching that man stick his arm in that guy's skull gave me the same pit in my stomach. The coroner wasn't smiling anymore, but his eyes were still all happy and open. He slid in up to his shoulder and it made a nasty sucking sound, and it was like he didn't have a care in the world. Honestly, it was the most relaxed I think he had been in years. 
I was backing away at this point, but he was waving me over like we were at a dang pool party and he wanted me to get in. Fight or flight response isn't truly really adequate in a situation where you're panicking. There's another one that people add sometimes, freeze, and that's exactly what I did as soon as I was out of his reach. Soon his other arm went in and his head and the rest of his body just into this guy's head. The hole didn't stretch or anything to accommodate him, and he didn't get crushed or anything either. He just went right in. I watched his feet go into this impossible tunnel like he was a cave diver. And then he was gone and I never saw him again. The men in suits ushered me out quickly after that. Ushered is a nice way to put it actually. They basically had to throw me by the seat of my pants because whatever they were saying to me, I just couldn't process it. I didn't even do any kind of cleanup, just a push out of the door and that was that. They told everyone that he had taken his own life, just couldn't do it anymore from the stress or the alcoholism or whatever. But I know what happened. I was expecting a knock on the door for a few weeks, thinking that some guys would take me away and that I would disappear too. It never happened though. Obviously, I guess they just figured that I wouldn't talk about it. Or if I did, nobody would believe me. But I found these records. He thumped the folder with the back of a finger. And I'm talking to you right now. You can keep these if you want. Do whatever with them. I spent a lot of time being afraid and I still am. But I guess now I'm more afraid of what would have happened to those people than being disappeared by some agency. I found out recently that some people from this office were told to exhume the bodies for some reason. But when they opened the coffins, the bodies weren't there. I thanked Cole for his time and he returned to work. I didn't open the folder until I returned to my office and when I did, it appeared to verify everything that he had said. I was closer to finding out the truth about what had happened at Grove Springs, but I felt no closer to finding out what the truth might mean. What had caused such bizarre phenomena? Was there really a nuclear meltdown at all? What had killed so many people and continued to kill people after the event had ended? It was only through a final coincidence, one last stroke of luck, that I was even able to begin to put the pieces together. I woke up to a rain of flesh this morning. Fist-sized chunks of meat fell on my bed, red sprinkling my blankets and body. Someone does not appreciate that I'm writing this down, sharing my experiences, letting you read the words published by Douglas Ray Cleveland and the brave individuals who helped him bring grow springs to light. This will be my final word to you, dear reader, before I hide myself in some deep place where I may be safe. Take care. Blast Radius, an investigation into the tragedy and cover-up of Grow Springs by Douglas Ray Cleveland Published August 2021 I received an envelope in my mailbox the day after I spoke with Cole. It had no address and when I asked my neighbors, nobody could recall seeing anybody near my home that day. Inside was a typed letter along with a video cassette. The author of the letter included a note that I do not release this video publicly, so her identity is not revealed, but she has permitted me to include screen caps. I watched the video in its entirety and have no doubt of its ferocity. The event at Grove Springs was not a nuclear accident. I will let the letter speak for itself. Mr. Cleveland, Project Skipjack was a power plant, that much is true. The city of Grove Springs did get its electricity from whatever they were doing down on the bowels of that building known to the public as the Grove Springs Nuclear Power Plant. It wasn't my job to understand how, though. I was just there to provide security. Keep people out, they told me. Keep people in, too, if it came to that. I had been on details like this before. They would tell you just enough that you would get a feel for what to do in an emergency. You learned early on not to ask too many questions. 
Things were bad before June 23rd, but the public didn't know about it. Way back when the power plant had first opened in 2008, a kid went missing from a neighborhood close by. He was only four or five, the same age as my son at the time. Later, sometimes people would see flashing lights in the woods or a cigar-shaped objects hovering in the sky. The higher-ups did a real good job of covering it all up. A scientist had been killed too in the laboratory. I didn't have to work that cleanup, but my buddies who did came back up a bit shell-shocked. One of them requested a transfer and after that, but it wasn't allowed to happen. He didn't survive the accident. It started in the afternoon and we were told that's when the technicians would rotate shifts, so we would know to be extra alert. The main lights went off and the emergency light system came on. The alarms didn't start yet though. They wanted to wait to see if I could get it back under control. This was relayed to me and my partner and I'll call him Delta over by radio by the head technician. No worry yet, they said. By the time the fire started, the alarm still hadn't gone off, so we radioed back. But there was no word. Someone I didn't recognize came into the security building and told us that it was code red out there, and the entire security team needed to be deployed to the plant, where the main power core was contained. We were untold of what it was, and just that we needed to help survivors put out the fire and that under no circumstances could anyone found at the plant leave without checking their identification, even in the middle of a meltdown. If they didn't have ID, we were told to kill them. We got suited up. Our core team was Delta and other people in the detail I'll call Gamma, Beta, and Epsilon. I had body armor, a sidearm, a knife, and a helmet. I was also tasked with keeping record of the accident on behalf of the researchers, so my helmet had a camera. Our fire suppression team went out ahead of us. They were successful in putting the fire out here, so I had no idea how it ended up spreading to the rest of the city. It initially played out like a standard search and rescue. Many of the rooms were hollowed out by the fire, charred black, smoky. It smelled strange though, like somebody had been spraying hair product. There was a lot of searching, but not a lot of rescuing. We cleared about three rooms before there was any sign of life. Down the hallway, there is a figure. It was small and it looked like it was coated in dark grease or oil or something. I couldn't tell if it was facing us or facing away because whatever was dripping off of it was so thick that its head was completely obscured. Epsilon called out, Hey, you there. But whoever it was, it didn't respond. They just ran off, feet slapping against the floor, down some random hallway. I wanted to pursue, but Delta got me back on track. Remember, he said over the earpiece, we gotta get to the core. I nodded and we kept going. There was ambient noise as we got closer, like a crowd of people talking and laughing at a party in a nearby room. Sometimes lights would go on and off in other rooms and... We would look and nothing would be there. About halfway down the staircase to the basement level where the core was, one of the walls had burst. A long skinny arm reached through a hole and started groping around with an oversized hand. It was burnt to a crisp. But whatever it was, it was reaching excitedly like a kid, getting the last skittle out of a bag. Gamma and Epsilon fired at it, but they either didn't hit it or didn't care because it picked Gamma up and it squeezed, before anybody could help. The thing played with his limp body through the hole in the wall, tapping Gamma's feet against the floor and shaking him up and down so his arms were flapping around. And I swear to God when that hand squeezed him to death, the only thing that came out of Gamma's body was strawberry ice cream. We ran before the rest of whatever the heck that thing was decided that it wanted to grab anybody else too sprinting down the stairs. Dark splotches were smeared on the wall. Sometimes there was an arm or a leg sticking out. At one point we had passed a human face lodged in the wall, which just wept and wept. I don't remember if it was Epsilon or if it was Delta that put a bullet in its head. The last flight of stairs were too damaged to access so 
We had to cross the first floor to find the alternate staircase on the other side of the building. I was hoping maybe we would actually find somebody that we could help, but I was wrong. It sounded like people were having a conversation all around us, not one that made any sense. The voices were cackling, howling, whimpering. The sharp, tangy smell from earlier was becoming overpowering. It felt like somebody was touching the bottom of my boots. Epsilon turned to me to say something, but before he could, his tongue fell out of his mouth and onto the ground. And then his fingers started falling off. His eyes drooped out of his head. He was thrashing and moaning. Blood made the floor slick enough that he slipped and fell. I knew it was Delta that took the shot this time. Epsilon didn't die though. He just kept falling apart all over the floor. Delta and I kept going dutifully forward. Maybe we could stop whatever this was if we just made it there. Noise from Epsilon's collapse must have gotten attention because back near the entrance to the first floor, a door creaked open. It was so loud that Delta and I turned around to look. It was a woman. She peeked her eyes out from the now open doorway. They were open manically wide, the whites visible even at a distance. She disappeared for a moment and after a pause, slunk out of the doorway. She was grinning or grimacing maybe, it was hard to tell. Her expression was in lining up with the sheer unhinged malice she seemed to exude. Shoulders slung low, head facing up. I could tell that if she got her hands on us, then that would be it. It was me, it couldn't be me, but it was. She wasn't wearing any clothes and every mole on my body, every crease in my skin, even my C-section scar, were all perfectly mirrored on hers. Slowly she approached. Behind her it seemed like she left a shadow, it was solid almost. A faint afterimage doubled over where she had just been. She waved when she saw us staring. We were in shock. That's the only way I could justify it to myself when Delta waved back. The woman went into a sprint, running towards us at a speed that I've never been capable of achieving. I fired my sidearm and saw that I had shot her straight through the forehead. She stopped for a moment, a line of after images slinging back behind her, before they snapped together and she was left wholly unharmed. We just had to beat her to the stairs, we just had to get to the core. Delta and I turned and started moving as fast as we could towards the staircase, but she got closer and closer, and I could tell that she was laughing through her clenched teeth. Right at the staircase, she was on us. I looked and she was there and I could feel her hot breath on my neck. I didn't realize I was doing it, but my feet were still moving and taking me down towards the basement. She was tearing apart Delta with her teeth. He didn't even scream, just looked at me like big eyes like he didn't know what was going on. As she pulled a loop after loop of intestines out of his torso. The basement was horrible. Bodies swung on hooks from the ceiling. Some animals were alive, dragging itself on the ground while it bleated pathetically. I moved down from the catwalk to the floor where the animal scooted past me before sinking into the floor. Charcoal bodies hung suspended in the air like they were held by an invisible string. Some of them were reaching out and grasping for help, and some were curled up, comforting themselves. Towards the middle of the room sat four giant batteries sticking out from the floor. There were four of them, all inscribed with some language that I didn't even recognize. Connected by cords, there was a seat between them all. It resembled an electric chair with a helmet and restraint straps, but the restraints had clearly been snapped. I was taking this all in when I heard the woman come into the basement. There was nothing that I could do. Whatever had done this, I couldn't stop it. I couldn't even begin to comprehend it. I took a deep breath before running to hide. There were pipes everywhere and I tried to find some that made a corner small. I contorted my body and compressed myself down into the fetal position. Tears streamed down my face but I was silent. My son would wonder why mommy didn't come home. 
Or maybe she would come home and it would be whatever the heck had just taken out Delta. Found you, she whispered. It felt like four hands were scratching me and digging into my skin, tearing through my clothes and ripping chunks out of my body. And then it felt like six hands, twelve hands, eight hands. I was kicking and screaming, too panicked to do anything other than try to protect my face. She was laughing and it sounded like a room full of people laughing. Maybe I started laughing, I don't know. My eyes were screwed shut and I could tell that I was bleeding and I just wanted it to be over. But something made her stop. She pulled away from me and I felt a cold little hand in my face. It was filmy and greasy but I leaned into the relief the coolness provided and sobbed. It pulled away, I heard wet footsteps walk away from me, and then I was standing at the entrance to the power plant. It was the next day and I was covered in red and some black substance that reeked like garbage, but I was alive. I collapsed on the ground and I radioed for assistance. I was given a significant amount of cash and a medical retirement. The first thing that I did with my newfound wealth was buy a house on the west coast and get the heck out of there. Whatever was in that power plant, whatever force had killed all those people, it was still out there as far as I knew. Nobody stopped it that day. The incident at Grouse Springs only ended because it wanted to end. Do you understand that? I told my employers that my camera broke. I'm not sure why they believed me, but they did. I kept the cassette. At the time, I wasn't sure why, but now I realize. I need people to know what happened. Good luck. In the early 1940s, the U.S. State Department along with the Army deliberately infected prisoners in Illinois with malaria in hopes of studying the effects on the human body. In 1943, the U.S. government conducted what is known as the Philadelphia Experiment, using unified fuel theory in the effort to make a ship completely undetectable. This ended poorly and many sailors aboard were left with PTSD as a result and one man lost his hand. Following this, the US government continued experimenting with magnetic fields and projects at Montauk using the underprivileged as test subjects. In 1950, the US Navy sprayed an allegedly harmless bacteria over San Francisco in an event called Operation Sea Spray. It turned out the disease caused pneumonia-like symptoms and many people became ill. Between 1960 and 1971, the Department of Defense paid to irritate cancer patients to record data on how high levels of radiation affect the human body. These are just a handful of examples the United States government has experimented on its own citizens, which were only revealed through the Freedom of Information Act. It is likely that there have been countless more times the United States has subjected civilians to unethical scientific research well into the modern day. I believe that the alleged paraphysical force powering the city of Gross Springs was one of these times, resulting in one of the most dangerous industrial accidents of all time. Information on Project Skipjack needs to be publicly released. The government needs to be held accountable for this tragedy. It is unacceptable to subject an entire town to understudied, highly lethal physical forces. And it is time for this matter held secret and the dark to come into light. We the citizens of the United States of America demand honesty. As a collector of newspapers, I have a vast collection of articles on missing persons. I'm not sure if it's a coincidence that a young boy went missing here in our world in 2008, in the neighborhood located near the woods in which I found the bodies that Cole described as vanishing. I have been seeing lights recently near my home. In my dreams, I see her face laughing at me. She's saying something, but I cannot understand. Douglas Ray Cleavon's diligent research and commitment to the truth is commendable. However, in his analysis of the events at Gross Springs, I believe he made a grave mistake. This could not be dismissed as an industrial accident. The Philadelphia Experiment, Project Montauk, the testing on American civilians conducted in the past. These events weren't about discovering new power sources. They were about developing a weapon.